Have you ever cooked on an open fire? I mean, really cooked something. This is the RV Life Podcast. I'm Dan Hunt with my incredible wife, Patty Hunt. We are live at the Thousand Trails in Orlando, Florida. And today's guest, well, guess what? He's got a YouTube channel that will teach you how to master campfire cooking. Two years on the road, Dan and I, and we've had to switch from cooking in a very large kitchen to cooking on a grill and in a small RV kitchen. Now, we've done some cooking over a campfire, but I can't wait to learn some new skills of campfire cooking. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm a grill guy but I'm going to learn something. I mean, we sat with our guest last night on our front porch here in Orlando. And I got to tell you, if you have never been to the Thousand Trails in Orlando, this place is really, really nice. This camp that we have a beautiful cement site that it's perfectly level. You, you can't beat this thing. It is a huge campground with so much to offer here. I, I know it just, it just never stops. Uh, and, and, I, I didn't let you do it, but they're, they, they were they were selling strawberries in the other parking lot. I wanted strawberries. I I, I know it 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 is uh it, it it is a lot of fun here. They have a lot of things to do. We really really enjoy uh, Thousand Trails, and if you want more information on Thousand Trails, you can go down to the show notes, and they are down there. We'll give you all that information that you need. <laughs> That sound means it's time for today's fun fact. 82% of Americans say that campfire nights remain among their most vivid memories. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I, I know. And I have to say, you know, I've been camping since I was four or five, six years old. And just the, the smells, the glow of the fire, the heat, the smoke getting in your clothes, my mom yelling and screaming about get away from the fire because it's going to burn you. I, I got to tell you, it, some of the best memories I have growing up are sitting around a campfire. Yes. For me, the marshmallows, even though those memories are only over the last two years or so. I know. We, 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 you, you didn't have any uh, campfire marshmallows when you were a kid, right? I don't think so. No, not that I can remember. She's a newbie. She's, she, she's a newbie. Well, you know what, Patty? Our guest today is going to teach us some ticks and ticks, ticks, some tips and tricks about cooking on an open fire. And I'll tell you, I've watched some of his videos. I, I, I just can't wait for this. I, I'm, I'm really excited. Okay, we will be back right after this. Why end your camping season when it gets cold? With the inflatable RV skirting system from Air Skirts, you can extend your camping season year-round. Reach out to Jim and his team by visiting airskirts.com for more information. RV Life Podcast listeners get $100 off a kit order when you use code RVPOD. That is RVPOD for $100 off. This RV Life podcast is sponsored in part by Clear 2O. Clear 2O continues to bring its expanding line of water filtration products to RVers with innovations such as their Dirt Guard Sediment Pre-Filter, their 1 Micron Solid Carbon Block Inline Water Filter, and a wide variety of high-quality filters for your RV's whole house filter system. When it comes to clean water for your RV life, the answer is clear. Clear 2O. Visit clear2o.com and use the coupon code RVLIFEPODCAST to save an additional 5% on every purchase. started his career in a GM factory building trucks. When the plant shut down, he took his severance package and invested it in himself by going to culinary school in Ohio. He found his way to Florida where he specialized in Floridian. We'll talk about that. And he also met his wife. He got the RV bug in 2018. And guess what? They never looked back from the road. His YouTube channel teaches you how to cook over the campfire. We have Matt Dean and his YouTube channel is American Campfire Creations. Welcome to the RV Life Podcast. How are you doing? We are always good, right? <laughs> 
Okay, we are going to jump right in because I am so excited to see what Dan can learn about cooking on a campfire, an open fire. I don't do the cooking, Dan does. So let's start. Why did you decide to go to culinary school? Well, growing up, I always loved food, obviously, like we all do, and um, knew nothing about cooking. Uh, And I figured as a young man, it'd be important for me to actually learn how to cook for myself, you know, as I got older. And uh, at the time, the automotive automotive crisis was happening back in 2007, 2008 timeframe, and I decided to go to culinary school because it seemed more recession proof, you know, cooking in restaurants is something we're always going to need. Um, so culinary school seemed like a good investment at the time. You know, I, I, I've got a question though. Just think back to the time that you're working in the factory, you're on the line, a little bit of pressure, people yelling at you, you don't do something right. The whole line's going to close down. Were you thinking about going to culinary school while you were still working or was it that, you know what, something happened, the plant shut down and now I've got a little bit of money so I can afford to go? Well, I got the idea, the initial culinary bug from a coworker who was going to culinary school while still at the factory while they were open. Uh, So they kind of gave me the general idea that it would be possible. So I didn't think into it too seriously until obviously the plant closed. But uh, yeah, I, at the time when working. Wow. Now culinary school, this is no joke. It was two and a half years, right? Correct. What was that like? What was your favorite part of it? Um, well, for me, knife skills was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, Another that, topic. Yes. That was actually our, our first class that we took because they wanted you to know obviously know how to properly cut food and things before getting into the more advanced stuff. But yeah, um, culinary school was very regimented. It was the two and a half years was um, sort of divvied up like a full-time job almost. It was eight hour days, five days a week. Wow. That's now, incredible. Now you're officially a chef. Correct. Oh, okay. Let's, let's chef, let, let's talk about this. And, and I want to, Go through campfire cooking. That's that's how you and I met uh, out by the lake one night. We were just talking and and talked about campfire cooking. So let's take it step by step. So the very first thing that you have to do is you have to have a campfire. Yes, yes. And 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 part of the campfire is the wood. Let's talk about wood. Okay. So my biggest uh, thing when being out on the road is your wood's going to come from different locations all the time, right? So you kind of have to keep that in mind when you're actually building your fire. And sometimes wood isn't even available. Uh, be, maybe where you are, uh, you weren't able to buy any at the store. Uh, it rained, so all the wood around you is too wet to use, things like that. You still need to cook, right? Um, so I might sometimes substitute using coal instead of wood, Things like that. Um, but uh, no, for me, I usually try to find something that uh, is a hardwood that will burn a little longer, um, keep the coals a little longer. That way I'll have time to cook a meal and still enjoy the fire afterwards, sit around it and enjoy the fire afterwards, So, which is always important to my wife. You, you talk about harder wood. Can you Can you be a little more specific for the guy that just got his camper? He's out on the road and... Do you just go into the Acme and pick up a thing of wood in the corner or do you look for something special? Um, So I definitely stay away from any kind of uh, processed wood. You don't want anything that has chemicals. You don't want to be burning a pallet or something over your campfire. So I I mostly stick to any kind of untreated wood, Um, hardwood. You know, you're looking, you're staying away from uh, things like pine, one not you don't want to really be burning over that um to look at is fine but eating over not so good um looking for you know things like hickory is a real big one uh apple wood uh cedar things like that wow a lot to learn here so don't just go out in the woods pick some wood and cook something over it but 
can we back up a second? When you talk about an open fire, you can you use like the campfire grill thing that people have at some campsites? Are there other ways to do it? Explain that to us. Yeah. So the grills that come with like the the flip fire pit uh, that just go right over your fire that you're burning. I have used those. I prefer not to because the grill marks that you get are kind of unsightly for the food that I like to make uh, because of the thick bars that they're usually on there. And they're a little grimy sometimes from being out in the weather and whatnot. So I will carry portable grates with me uh, from site to site that I clean and sanitize and we'll use those after the fire has started to burn down to coals. So I think that's a really important point right there. Um, you don't start a fire and start cooking. Right. Explain that process to us, would you? Yeah. So the, the biggest uh, mistake that people will do when they first start cooking over campfires is they'll expose the food directly to the flame, which has a tendency to, put a chemically sooty taste on the outside, burning it essentially before the inside is even cooked and putting a bad taste on the food, like vegetables and things like that. Um, The smoke can rear up from the flares uh, that will put that chemically taste on there. And that's just something you really want to avoid when you are are cooking over an open flame. So you'll want to take the time to let the wood actually burn down a bit. That way you can... Uh, get the cooking benefit of the heat without actually getting the sooty chemically taste from the flare ups. That's the same thing with coal as well, right? right? You burn it and you let it go. Now I'm not very patient. We already established that I don't like to cook. So I'm going to have a snack before this because how Mm. long when you say, let's, let's say we're making a chicken pieces of chicken, but how long is that going to take for the wood or the coal to burn burn down, and then be ready for cooking. Well, that's another kind of uh, challenge that you'll find with uh, open fire cooking because all wood burns differently. Um, If the size of the wood burns differently, uh, if it was wet recently, burns differently, things like that. Um, How how much um, air you're actually getting to the fire will help with uh, how fast the burn is as well. Um, open uh, bottom parts of fire pits that have uh, air access actually cause the fire to burn a little quicker, which is something you kind of want when you're trying to cook over it, not necessarily sit and enjoy it because you want the fire to last a little longer, right? Um, To our point of cooking, we definitely want uh, the coals to be there as soon as possible, but we want them to last as long as possible. Okay, so definitely a skill here. Yeah. Now, is there some, but something that somebody could carry with them that makes this more portable? Um, with starting the fires? or Yeah, like if you're saying that sometimes the campground grills don't work really well. Right. So uh, one of the things that we noticed in our travels is that not all, especially out west, uh, campgrounds have a fire ring, right? So I, we don't have one here where we're at this thousand trails. They do not have campfire rings around all of the, the exactly. Sites. And I and I assume that's because of campgrounds like this one don't really want to promote open flame fires near other RVs. Um, and out west, they don't necessarily want to promote open flame fires because of how dry it is and the uh, chance of, you know, forest fires and things like that, which you have to respect. Uh, so what we have done is had as rudimentary as building a camp ring out of stones, and then putting my, like I was saying earlier, portable grill grate over that and cooking that way, or even so much as uh, purchasing one of the portable fire pits that they sell on Amazon, which we had originally when we started, um, they just make, you know, these small little portable fire pits that you can buy that come with grill grates, then you can do the process that way. So the big question I have when I start a fire and I've got, let's say we're at a campground that has one of those tire rings that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay. Do I have to get the embers around the entire ring or can I just use the middle part of it or 
How, t- talk about that process for me. So that's actually a good question because I don't wait for the whole fire to burn down to embers. What I'll do is as the fire is burning, start moving the coals to one side and leaving the other side to burn or even adding more wood to it. So that way, if need be, I can add more coals to the other side to constantly keep my heat going. Because one of the biggest things that, uh, when people are cooking over campfires, they don't realize that all of that's going to burn down very quickly. And you're going to run out of having the right amount of heat to say, cook a chicken before it's done. And you want to keep the fuel going just like you would on a regular gas grill. Right. And you'll use that fire pit like you would a gas grill with hot spots as well. So, so let's talk about hot spots. Um, do you have a tool or some kind of thermostat or something that you can see where the hotter parts are? A thermometer. Uh, th- I think. Thermometer. Yeah. yeah. Thermometer. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, well, at this point in my life, I've able, I've been able to use my experience to gauge where the heat is with my hand. Um, and then of course, by putting whatever food I might be cooking uh, at that time on different spots of the grill, I can tell once I've say put down a steak, over a certain part of the fire, and then I go to flip it, I can tell how fast it's going to take. And I need to take that into consideration when cooking the other parts of the meal. Oh, okay. So one of the things I learned in cooking school, I'm not a chef. I just went to a six week program is that when you put a piece of meat on a grill like that, it should be really, really hot to start with. Correct. And you don't want to pull it off if it's sticking. Correct. Tell, tell me about that process. Let's let's talk about, I know we've all had a steak on a grill and you go to pick it up to turn it over and it's like stuck there. Right. If it's sticking, that means the meat, either you started with your heat too cold, um, like you were saying, or you're not letting the meat cook long enough on that side. Right. So... Uh, As the meat cooks, the fats and things release, um, making it so that it's not going to stick to your surface, say like same happens in a pan. It's going to make it so that it's not going to stick when you go to actually, I like to counter turn instead of just doing a one flip, just because that's, I like the presentation wise with the counter turn marks. It's a chef thing. Yeah. (laughs) So what I'll, I'll do. And now over the years of experience, I've gotten it down to a timing in my mind, which I noticed um, that you like to use the the timer for cooking your steak, right? um, which is fine. But for me cooking professionally, I can't do that. We don't have time for that. So I had to, you know, learn it in my mind. And now I can do it without even looking at it. So I can just be going and prepping something else. And I know on my mind, oh, time to flip it. Right. The timer is very useful because Dan will sometimes get distracted when cooking. So I think that helps sometimes. I I don't know that I, and I very rarely cook, but I think I don't know. I'm I'm impatient. So I Mm want to move it or Mm -hmm. turn it or do something. And that's a big mistake. You don't want to touch the food while it's cooking. Just let it do its thing. And then when it's time, then you do it. But patience is something. Yes. Okay. So for our audience, wherever you're cooking. So even if it's just on a regular barbecue grill, the Blackstone, whatever it is, be patient, let it do its thing. I just want to make sure people hear that. I, I want to make sure that you heard that. You got to be patient <laughs> yes. and let I, it just do its thing. I just don't cook and that's the solve for this. Okay. You are listening to the RV Life Podcast. We are here with Matt Dean. He's the campfire chef and we're going to be back with him. So we, we, we've got the fire started. We've got it nice and hot. It's time to put the food on and we're going to do that right after this break. When traveling in your RV, how do you navigate? Do you use a paper map, a GPS, or do you use Google Maps? Our sponsor, RV Trip Wizard, has the solution, and it just works. It just works. Yes, it does. RV Life, RV Trip Wizard is a great way to navigate. Don't move your RV without it. And today we're giving our listeners a 25% discount with the code in the show notes. So if you are interested in RV life, just go down to the show notes 
Take a look at that discount code. I'll give you a hint. It's RV Life Podcast. RV Life Podcast. That's the the code for it. You'll get 25% off. You got a seven-day free trial. I have to tell you, we do not move our RV one inch, not an inch, without first checking in with RV Life. Okay. So now I just want to get back to cooking Let's talk about beginners. What do you think? We talk to a lot of people in campgrounds. You know, the question we, we, Dan and I have five kids between us. And the question always is what's for dinner. I don't think that changes a whole lot when you're camping. Now let's say somebody is a beginner in cooking this way on an open flame. Well, so to speak, um, what would be a good meal to start if you're a beginner? Um, I, I like to start with something that's a little leaner because the more fat content that is in whatever you're cooking over an open flame, uh, the more flare up you're going to get, um, because the grease acts is like, a, um, um, uh, you know what I mean? The, mm-hmm. and what accelerant, yes, I'm sorry. There yes, you go. An accelerant. Um, so that fat will act as an accelerant and, uh, cause, like I was saying earlier, the, those flare ups and the, uh, the smoke being released into the food. So I think that's one of the biggest, um, tricks that you have to master over time is the, um, types of food that it is that you're cooking. Um, and just really watching that it's interesting cooking over a campfire. Isn't like cooking over a gas grill or even a charcoal grill for that matter, because um, you you have a lot of different variables working against you and uh, not just the fire itself, but like the elements around you of wherever it is you might be cooking. Uh, Most of the times when we're out doing this, it's in uh, some, some type of boondocking situations. We might be out in the middle of nowhere and we're always doing this for our dinner meal. So as the sun goes down and you're cooking food out in the middle of nowhere, sometimes you have to worry about the animals coming around as well because of the smell of what you're putting off. So, but yeah. Okay. So when you say foods that don't have a lot of fat, so I'll cook. And again, I'm breaking it down for those beginner cookers like myself. So chicken without skin, some type of meat that doesn't have the marbling, like a London broil or a filet doesn't have as much fat, they might be a little easier to yeah. cook. And I'm sure as as children, we, we remember the hockey pucks that used to come off of the grill when we would go camping, you know, the burgers getting overcooked. That's because of all that delicious fat coming out of them and going down into the fire and causing them to burn or the, the brats that would do the same thing, you know. Um, but we love those all the same. But the idea with how I like to cook is to have food come out, say how it would in a restaurant, not overdone. And so, so we, we, we've got a restaurant at our campsite. Yes, (laughs) yes, we do. And, and while again, my patience is limited talking to you yesterday about some of the things that you cook this way, my mouth was watering. So I'm really looking forward to it. Let's talk about prep. You know, you, you were over and we were barbecuing last night. I took a London broil from the package to the grill. Not the best way to do it. If my teacher would have seen that, uh, she would have got her knife skills out on me, I think, a little bit. So I, I went from the package to the grill. Not the best way to do that. Let's talk. Um, and, and and if we could, let, let's, let's talk beef, pork, and chicken. Oh. What are, what are some of the things that you should do to prep those things before you put them on a campfire? Well, uh, letting the meat rest a little bit. And then I actually like to have things come up to a little closer to room temperature before I put them on the grill, especially steak um, and chicken. Uh, because, well, first of all, chicken, you definitely want to get to the right temperature. You know, it's 165 to 170 is a good temperature for cooking, safe you're temperature to eat. Correct. Okay, yeah, to, to cook eat. it at that. Okay, uh, to get it to that temperature. Okay. Yes. Uh, Do you have one of those little uh, pokey things the in your thermometers? Yeah. yeah. I sometimes will use those for the thicker cuts, uh, but I usually just go based off of feel. Right. Time. Just, just the. Yeah. They, they call it doughiness. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
Um, but you never want to cut into the meat to check the doneness. That's a rookie mistake right there. Yeah, do it all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Done it. Um, but yeah, uh, so with the pork, uh, you know, same thing. You want to try and not take things right out of the refrigerator, like you were saying, or right out of the package and right onto the grill. I will season them, uh, lightly oil them, you know, as well as the grill grates. Uh, so you don't get, uh, not that you would technically have to worry about sticking, but like, I just want to cover all my bases, especially with things like fish. Fish is very tricky. Um, and that would be something that I wouldn't recommend people go right into trying to cook over an open flame because, you know, the sticking is a huge problem, especially with those campground grills, those with the thick grates, uh, right. huge problem. Um, but yeah, now, like I was saying, you know, just make sure those things are seasoned well, oiled maybe, and then uh, closer to room temperature. So on that note, as you're talking, I think for me and a lot of people, we worry about, you know, meat sitting out or chicken sitting out and it getting bad and people getting sick. Mm -hmm. You brought up the chicken should be cooked at 165 degrees. Right. Pork as well has to be cooked thoroughly, right? Yeah, I believe it's 155 for pork, um, but pork can actually be cooked to temperature, kind of like steak. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's not, good to know. Uh, no, I don't mean like, uh, you know, bacon and, and things like that, but I right. mean like uh, if you were doing pork chops. Why okay. Not? So that's good to know. So I would think, you know, used to think if I take the steak out, because Dan would say, well, we have to take it out, let it get to room temperature, it was going to get bacteria and it'd make me sick. And so, you are clearly saying take your meat out, let it get to room temperature, then cook it to where it needs to be cooked to. I just wanted to be really clear with that because I know it was a concern for me. Mm -hmm. So just putting that out to our audience. And, you, you, you know, one of the things that we do realize on a podcast, there's no pictures. We will have some pictures uh, that we do put up on our social media so you can see the cuts of meats or some of the things that we're talking about. But one of the other things that, you know, Matt has said that actually I think Matt's wife said that he would do is that, you know, he's going to come over to our campsite and we're going to actually do a video that we're going to post on our YouTube channel, Exploring Through Our Lens. Matt, you're going to put it up on your YouTube channel as well or Correct. cuts of it. What, yes. what, tell us the name of your YouTube channel. It's American Campfire Creations. And there'll be a link to that down in the show notes as well. So I know sometimes it's hard to get a picture about what we're talking about, but we're going to take you through the process of building a fire. Uh, we're going to cook a chicken. Let's talk about sides a little bit because that, that's the next thing that uh, comes up. Uh, I, I don't want just chicken. I, mm -hmm. I, I want more. Yes. So let, let's talk about how to cook more on that campfire. So I always try to pair my protein with some type of vegetable and starch or rice um, I usually go for potatoes just because they're the easiest to cook over the campfire. And I like to use my iron skillets for those kinds of things, uh, roasting them and whatnot. Uh, red skins are my favorite. Now you put the, the cast iron skillet right on the fire right or you put it on the grate above the fire? Um, well, I can get it nice and warm and ready to use on the grate. But if I really want to get things nice and roasty, I'll put it right down in the coals. You'll, you'll take that pan and just put it right down into the coals. Correct. I, I don't know about anybody else, but again, we don't have any visuals here either, but my mouth is watering. Uh -huh. So, okay, continue. We're going to need to eat after this. Yeah. The, uh, the great thing about cooking an iron is that it can withstand that kind of heat. So they're basically indestructible in a way. Uh, but yeah, I'll usually put my iron skillet down in the coals, put a little oil in there, roast up some potatoes, rosemary, garlic, salt, and pepper, real basic cooking. I don't like to get too, too fancy when it comes to cooking over the grill because, you know, I mean, you're, you're at a campsite. You just want good food. No, 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 no. You, you've made my campsite into a restaurant. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> We're going to have these nice tablecloths that uh, Luxury in the Outdoors has supplied for us. We're going to have these nice tablecloths out there. We're going to cook some Chicken, and I think you said potatoes and asparagus tomorrow night, right? Yes, yes. Now, the next question that I have to ask is, in today's environment, you have people that are gluten-free, you have vegetarians, you have vegans. We've talked about the meats. 
what do you do with, and, and your wife's vegan now too, she is, right? She is. She's vegan. And we both have actually been gluten-free uh, going on eight years now. And uh, I do eat beef uh, and can eat gluten. I choose not to eat gluten because of her. It's just easier for us both to be that way. I do eat beef very rarely though. Uh, it's only if I go to a restaurant or uh, am um, cooking for friends who also eat beef, we'll do a steak and it's always ribeye. I love bone and ribeye. But uh, no, like uh, you were saying, my wife, her diet is very particular. So I have to be very inclusive with her when des designing dinner plans. Uh, and she always wants, you know, the delicious, healthy food, not just plain old, you know, healthy veggies or whatever that people might be uh, envisioning in their mind. The idea here is to make something healthy, but also taste good. So, okay. you know, you said something last night to us, um, when I have a vegetarian, a vegan or whatever coming over and visiting us or whatever, I head to the grocery store and buy a veggie burger. Mm. You don't do it that way. No. Tell us how you do it. So what I'll do is I'll usually make, um, if we're going to do like veggie burgers per se, or, um, like uh, veggie meatballs uh, for her pasta dishes. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll actually make those in, uh, myself instead of buying something that's prepackaged that comes with all the preservatives and things like the fillers that you really don't want in your food um, and kind of give vegetarian food a bad name. So what I'll do is I'll just make those things from whole foods that I can pick up myself and actually create and control what is going into her food that way. And she loves it. So. That's great. Now, what did you say you were going to make tomorrow for her? Because we're going to have chicken. What were yes. you going to make for her? Yeah. So uh, tomorrow we'll do the quartered chicken. We'll do the grilled asparagus, the roasted red skin potatoes. And then for her, I'll marinate uh, a tofu. She loves tofu. So I'll do a marinated tofu and grill that just like I would a burger over the right on the grate. When I was a kid, I don't think the, the term vegetarian was not very main line. I mean, I guess I'm showing my age, but, but it, it was not a, a nowadays though, when we do big events or, you know, when you're cooking for people or going over to people's house, it's almost a common place now that you have to have a vegetarian choice. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to grill for a vegetarian or do you think it's just about the same thing, both sides of the fence? Um, same thing. I try to be respectful and keep the food obviously away from the protein. Uh, don't, I try to do no cross contamination, which is a big thing for chefs. Um, but yes, I, uh, I basically just grill just like I would anything else. Okay. You know, uh, we're running a little bit long on time, but I want to talk about something else because it, it's just so interesting. You're a chef. You live in a camper and you travel around the country, but that's not enough for you. You guys decided to buy a piece of property up in Washington state and tell us what you did with that piece of property. So essentially we were just living there in our RV uh, seasonally. And we decided while we're traveling that we could open it up to guests. And we decided to start a glamping site on our property called the sleepy Sasquatch and open it up on all the uh, booking sites, Airbnb, hip camp and whatnot. And uh, people seem to love it. Uh, it's just a bell tent site on a platform uh, overlooking the Cascade, Northern Cascade mountains. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it sounds amazing. And I will tell you, I did see pictures. We are going to put pictures of that tent up, that bell tent up. It just, looks beautiful. Um, we are going to put it up on our social media. That is RV life podcast, Instagram or Facebook. And you could check out this incredible place. Oh, uh, it, it, you know, I, I'm sitting there last night and, and you, you showed me on your phone and I, I saw the sunset in the background and then I took a double check. It, it it, it, it's almost breathless. It takes your breath away. Just looking at this thing. It is just so beautiful. Very affordable, um, but very rural. Very, talk, talk, talk about it. There's no power there. No, it's completely off grid, um, which 
actually people seem to really be enjoying right now. Uh, going out and camping and enjoying nature is very popular right now amongst younger people and just people who love the outdoors. So. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take your hotel person hat off for a second and bring you back to your chef hat. Although you don't wear a chef hat, you just wear a bandana. I, I, I get it. <laughs> Do you have a secret recipe? Is there something that our listeners would really, really, really like that they can easily use or maybe fix up at home before they hit the road and have it with them in their campground that really will help them when cooking on an open fire? No pressure here. No, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> take, take Putting you on the spot a little yes, bit, but, really. but yeah, you, you can handle it. Well, one of the biggest tricks that I've noticed is that pre-marinating your meats ahead of time to take on the road with you on your whatever trip you're going on, or even people who do this full time, pre-marinating your meats is a is a huge benefit to getting flavor into whatever it is you're cooking meats uh, specifically, or even the tofu, like I was saying. So I will soak those in whatever flavor profile I'm going for, for that particular meal and have them ready for me ahead of time, a day or two out. So that would be one of my, and that's an easy trick to do, you know? So when the kids and the family or even me says what's for dinner tonight, you could just pull it out. It's pre-marinated, no thinking, Get it on that grill and ready. Yeah, I will spend one day, um, uh, usually a Sunday or a Monday, planning what we're going to have for the week. Just like I would in a restaurant. You know, I plan these, I create these menus, I plan this food, uh, the portion sizes all the way down to the littlest ingredient. So I do no different at home. I plan my <coughs> our meals, I make it so that uh, how we eat at home is essentially how I would feed my guests at the restaurant. This has just been absolutely incredible. And again, you can check out Matt's YouTube channel, and that is in the notes below. You can actually watch Matt cook at our campsite. It's it 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 it, it is restaurant a la hunt <laughs> at our at our campsite tomorrow night. We're going to film the whole thing. We're gonna put it up on YouTube so you can experience what what we see here and how great that is you are listening to the rv life podcast i'm dan hunt with my incredible wife patty hunt matt you know what uh we do have our question of the week coming up you want to stick around and uh hang out and get our question of the week with us that sounds great okay i'm dan hunt with my wife patty hunt and we will be back right after this. This podcast is brought to you in part by RVinsurance.com. Getting proper insurance coverage for RVers can be difficult as the RV lifestyle tends to take us away from our stated coverage area. The RVer Insurance Exchange can help RVers navigate tricky waters of health insurance and find a policy that travels with you so you can enjoy RVing without worrying that your policy won't cover you. The agents at RVerInsurance.com are real RVers that understand the unique needs of those enjoying the RV life. Visit RVerInsurance.com or call 1-800-867-4330 and let the experts at RVer Insurance work for you. National Indoor RV Centers with over 1,000 motorhomes available across multiple locations. National Indoor RV Centers continues to provide an outstanding hassle-free motorhome ownership experience. National Indoor is the number one Newmar dealer in the nation and also features brands like Integra, Winnebago, and much more. Visit nirvc.com and become a part Part of the National Indoor RV Center's family. I'm Dan Hunt, and this is the RV Life Podcast. I'm here with my incredible wife, Patty Hunt. And you know what? You're going to be even more incredible after the show because I know you have been taking notes. You got your computer out. You're ready to go. And you will be doing the cooking for the rest of the month. I don't think so. <laughs> nope, not happening. <laughs> I'm Matt, you know, to people who enjoy it. Yeah, you know, Matt, I, I, I do have an extra cubby in the back, and you can maybe just kind of come along with us and do all the. We, we, we could use use that for a, a little while. Um, you know, every week we do a piece, and 
I, I kind of gloss over it a lot of the time, uh, but it's done by Pat Buchanan of RV Life. And it, it's a pro tip. Even though we are users and we speak about RV Life when we speak about RV Trip Wizard, every single week, I feel like I pick something up from Patrick. Absolutely. We, again, we've been using RV Trip Wizard for over two years now. And sometimes he'll say something in a tip or to us when we're talking and we'll say, oh my goodness, didn't even know about that. And it's just something life changing, like really helpful. Well, I do not know what this week's tip is. So let's see what we can get from Pat Cube Cannon, the RV Life Pro Tip of the Week. RV Life makes it easy to share your exciting RV trip with friends and family via the RV Life Trip Wizard. To share a trip with another Trip Wizard user, first open your trip, click on the wrench icon, and choose Share Trip. Now click Share Trip with another Trip Wizard user and enter the email address that person uses for their own Trip Wizard account and click Send. Your friend or family member will find your trip in their own Trip Wizard account under tentative trips where they can view, copy, or even change the trip according to their own needs. If you simply want to share a view of your trip, even to those without an RV Life Pro account, simply choose Visitor View after clicking Share Trip and create a shareable link that allows others to see your RV journey just as you've planned it. I'm Pat Buchanan with your RV Life Pro Tip of the Week. This is a great tip. When Dan and I are planning a trip, before we get on the road, we do share our trip with at least two other people, my brother, a good friend, just so they know where we're going to be. Uh, it's a good safety feature, not only, you know, as well as kind of keeping your family informed of uh, our crazy life, I guess you could say. Now, one of my favorite parts of this show is a question of the week. And today we love that we have Miranda here live with us and she's going to ask her question. Miranda, thanks for coming on. You're welcome. So the question I have is, okay. Close. So the question I have is, um, it seems like it would take a lot longer to cook on a campfire than a grill. So what makes it worthwhile? That's a great question. Um, I think it has to go has to do with uh, what we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, with uh, the nostalgic feel of actually cooking over a campfire, and sort of going back to how things were when we were growing up, and actually learning how much of a passion we had for this type of lifestyle. So yes, it would be easy for me to just get a normal grill that has the little propane tank and just light that up or get a little black stone or something. He's making fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. No, no, I completely support that. And I understand the convenience of it, especially like people with busy lives, with children, things like that. They might not necessarily have time to build a whole campfire and wait and whatnot, which I understand. Um, I, I just feel like every once in a while when there is a little bit of spare time and, and you uh, say are already maybe planning to have a little campfire uh, night, you know, where you just sit out under the stars and enjoy, like I was saying, that nostalgic feeling of just being in front of the campfire, then maybe just add that little extra uh, plan of making your dinner for the evening over that campfire. And it just adds a little extra fun thing for the family to do. And I personally, I just, I love that going back to, uh, you know, our roots kind of cooking. I, I've always been a huge fan of that. And my wife loves just watching me do it, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'm with her. <laughs> yeah. So she's always just loving the, just sitting in the camp, uh, next to the campfire and just enjoying my hard work at the <laughs> end of it. But, uh, but yeah, no, I would say the reason why, I would suggest trying it if you haven't done it before is basically uh, just for the fun of it and the nostalgia of it. And, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a little, um, you know, event, like a camping event that you can do. And it's a lot of fun. So a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And you know what? I can feel it. I can feel your passion. It sounds awesome. I can't wait till tomorrow when we do this. And, my last question is, what's for dessert? Oh, 
Yes, it's funny you ask that. I am actually a terrible baker. Wow. So, like, I don't know why, but every time I mess up the cookies. So. Okay, so we're just going to go with s'mores. Cause uh, yes, always- s'mores are easy. I can I- do s'mores. Yeah, you, uh, okay. you can do s'mores. Is, is there a special recipe for s'mores? <laughs> so, uh, uh, the chocolate can't be too hard. Oh, thick. There, there you so go. So it melts. <laughs> um, you know, the, the one other thing that I wanted to point out from Miranda's question, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the flavor is really enhanced cooking on a wood fire over a gas grill. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so wood or coal um, adds the flavor from those um those burning sources to whatever it is you're eating. So it just enhances the flavors, the types of wood, the types of coal. Uh, you just don't get that with gas. Yeah. Gas is cleaner um, and easier, but uh, you're losing out on that experience when you're having the meal. So it gets in your clothes better too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Correct. Correct. So, well, you know, Matt, it has been really, really great having you here with us on the RV Life podcast. Uh, and again, I'm just going to point out that if you want to get a hold of Matt, if you want to watch some of his videos, his YouTube channel and links to get to him will be in the show notes. We will do an exploring through our lens over on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see Matt working in, in you know, the, the thick of things. Uh, I don't think Patty's going to be much in that. I think she's going to be shooting because she doesn't cook. But we'll 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 get the camera from her when she's cleaning everything up later on. We'll just we'll just get that part of it done. Um, but yeah, Matt, it, it 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 has really been great uh, to have you here this week. You know, Patty, last week we were at the Jacksonville RV show and we did some podcasts there that were great. They were. It was great talking to people that have had experience camping. For 40 years each, I think between the three of you, you had a hundred years of experience plus and the nostalgia that was talked about the changes in, you know, what's happened over the time, this 40 years. It, it, we had a fun time at that show. We, we really did. And, and that was one of the shows, like, what would you ask somebody with a hundred years of experience? That show's already up on the podcast channel and it, it's... <laughs> It's really some interesting, interesting information. But then we also talked to George from General RV. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, Greg. Greg. George, Greg. It says George. We we talked to Greg from General RV, and we talked about the importance of an RV show and doing your research. And we also learned some tips to really get some great deals at an RV show. Things that I did not know. It was really very enlightening. And I hope that we got the questions answered that we hear people talk about. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that time there. And, and that show will be up in the next couple of weeks. I, I, I got to tell you, our travels and what we get to do and what we get to bring to you, our listeners, is just really, really A a lot of fun. I am loving each and every day of it. You are listening to the RV Life Podcast. We are live at the Thousand Trails Orlando. This is the crown jewel of the Thousand Trails system. We are live here and we are having a great time. The weather is absolutely beautiful beautifully hot and you know here here we are in february and it was hot out there today but we are having a great time i am dan hunt with my incredible wife patty hunt saying have a great rest of today and an even better day tomorrow